Support comes from the Houston Methodist Neurological Institute, recognizing Dr. Q. Sun Yoon's landmark study cataloging more than 200,000 unique cells associated with glioblastoma tumors. This study provides a comprehensive picture of the brain's immune response and points to new avenues of treatment for neurological disease. Learn more at HoustonMethodist.org slash brain immunity. This is Jose Merino, Editor-in-Chief of the Neurology Family of Journals. The Neurology Podcast provides practical information to neurologists and other clinicians to help them provide better care for their patients. Thanks for listening and have a great week. Hi, this is Tisha Monteith with the Neurology Podcast. I'm here with Alex Sinclair, Professor of Neurology, University of Birmingham, to discuss her paper that was recently published in Neurology in February called Disease Course and Long-Term Outcomes in Pregnant Women with Idiopathic Intracranial Hypertension, the IIH Prospective Maternity Health Study. Hi, Alex. How are you? Hello. Really well, and thank you for having me. I want to know what led to the study, but, you know, you put two things together, pregnancy states, which can cause intracranial hypertension and, of course, the idiopathic intracranial hypertension. Why hasn't there been more studies like this before? Well, I think some of these studies take quite a a bit of long-term planning, but it's been something on our mind for a really long time. I run a really busy IIH clinic in the UK and probably one of the most commonly asked questions from my patients and also from my doctor colleagues is what's going to happen to the patients when they get pregnant. And that was really why we started out on this study, because of that sort of common theme coming up in clinic. And that's that worry from patients and that worry from doctors about the impact of pregnancy. Idiopathic intracranial hypertension, which I'm going to call IIH, is a condition which is increasingly common. And we see that it's particularly common in women who gain weight. And gaining weight in pregnancy is is very common. And pregnancy often leaves women at increased weight after the pregnancy. And so there's a concern that IIH could definitely exacerbate during a pregnancy. And I guess the other concern comes from the the pathogenesis that we're uncovering in IIH. We're understanding a lot more about the disease, about how it's really much more of a systemic metabolic disease with changes in hormone profiles, particularly increased um, testosterone, which seems to be important in driving the disease, and testosterone levels increase during pregnancy. So there's a number of theoretical reasons why both the patients and the doctors are worried that outcomes could be poor for patients during pregnancy. That is really important to think about because of all the metabolic changes, as we know, increase sugars, sometimes for some patients, hypertension itself. And so there's a lot of stress on the body. Let's start with the design. How did you design the study? Well, as I say, it's been a long time in the planning. It's a prospective observational cohort study, and it was carried out over nine years. So it was a really long time ago that we started putting this all together. And we collected data between April 2012 and September 2021. And we collected data on all consecutive patients that came through our busy clinical service. And we collected very standardized data at all of their clinic visits. So we collected really in line with clinical practice. And we made sure that all the patients that came into the study had a confirmed diagnosis of IIH. And we used the modified DANDY criteria, which states that all patients would have a lumbar puncture opening pressure at diagnosis greater than 25. All of them have papilledema at diagnosis. And there's a series of other exclusions, for example, other focal neurology or abnormal CSF. And they can only have imaging features consistent with raised brain pressure. So we collected a really clean cohort and we excluded any secondary causes of IIH, for example, IIH caused by drugs or IIH caused by anemia or raised pressure caused by a venous thrombosis. So we exclude all of those. And we also excluded anybody with a rare condition called IIH WOP, W-O-P, which is IIH without papilledema. So this study only relates to the patients with true confirmed idiopathic intracranial hypertension. And as we are aware, this is usually a disease that's seen in young women between puberty and menopause. It's usually associated with increased weight and a body mass index greater than 30. So what we did with this prospective cohort is we had a standardized data collection where we collected things like their date of birth, their BMI, their weight, the date of the diagnosis, the diagnostic opening pressures. 
the medications that they were on. Then we also collected data on a health questionnaire about relating particularly to female health. So we asked them questions, which I'll talk about, relating to things like how many pregnancies and how many miscarriages they had. And then we collected vision data. So we wanted to know all about their visual acuity, about their papilledema. And we, we did that by recording data from an, an optical coherence tomography machine, which measures the swelling of the nerve at the back of the eye. And in particular, we recorded the retinal nerve fiber layer, which is a reflectance of papilledema. And we recorded the ganglion cell layer, which tells us about the amount of atrophy of the axons of the optic nerve. And then we recorded the visual field using a Humphrey visual field machine. And what we also do in our ophthalmology clinics is we grade how much papilledema there is with zero being none and five being the most possible papilledema you can have. And then they also did headache um, diaries. And this is a very standardized technique where we would, over a month's period, we would record the headache frequency or what we might call the monthly headache days. We record the headache severity, where zero is none and 10 is the worst severity of headache they could imagine. And then we record the amount of painkiller days they have per month. That was the data collection that we did. And then what we did was we wanted to understand the differences between different types of cohorts and how the pregnancy related. So we divided them into four different groups, our patients. We had the first group, which was those that had IIH diagnosed during their pregnancy. Then we had the second group, that those that had IIH that was already established but then became pregnant. And then we had the third group, where we had that the pregnancy had occurred prior to their IIH being diagnosed and they had not had a pregnancy during IIH. And then the fourth group is that they'd never had any pregnancies either prior to their diagnosis of IIH or afterwards. And by having these four groups, we were able to look at the differences between them. Can you just give us a little information about what these patients look like, the mean age, average BMI? The cohorts were actually really similar, these four groups that I've described. The average of all of them was a BMI of 39, which is quite typical for our cohorts of, of IIH in the UK, average age of 31, and the average diagnostic opening pressure at, um, at diagnosis was 35 centimetres of CSF. Great. And what was the primary outcome measure? Well, the most important thing in this study was to look at the impact of the pregnancy on visual outcomes. So in terms of Humphrey visual field, perimetric mean deviation, and also the OCT measures of papilledema, which was the retinal nerve fiber layer. And what did you find? So it was actually really interesting. We, in total, we, we had 377 women who were eligible for the study. And the sort of split between the four groups was that we had about 2% of them who were diagnosed with IIH whilst they were pregnant. We had 12% who had established IIH who became pregnant. And then we had 48% who had only had pregnancies prior to their diagnosis of IIH and 38% who never had a pregnancy at all, either prior to or after a diagnosis. And what we saw was that none of the patients were on any medications during pregnancy because we tend to stop them. And I might come back and talk about that later on. In terms of the maternal health questionnaire that the patients filled out, I thought this was particularly interesting because we saw that 16% of the patients had postponed their pregnancy due to a diagnosis of IIH. But we saw that 22% had had difficulties getting pregnant, 31% had changed their contraception, but most worryingly, and I think to be remarked on really, is that 7% had had an unwanted or unplanned pregnancy due to having their contraceptives changed at diagnosis. So that was something that we will certainly would be reflecting on in our clinical practice. But then coming to the prognosis, particularly relating to vision, if you have a pregnancy during IIH. And first of all, we compared that group who had established IIH, who then became pregnant, to those who had IIH that never became pregnant. And the most important thing that we saw was that the visual outcomes were no different between these groups. So we looked at the logmar visual acuity, we looked at the visual fields, we looked at those measures of papilledema using OCT, i.e. the retinal nerve fiber layer, and the measures of ganglion cell loss, the GCL, and we saw that there was no significant difference between those two groups. So that was very reassuring. But in the group that became that were diagnosed with IIH at the same time as being pregnant, they did have a worse picture. And what we saw in these patients was that it was very unusual. It was only 2% of our cohort. But we saw that they had deteriorations in their visual field, deteriorations in their papilledema. So their papilledema got worse. 
um, during the pregnancy. But then we followed them up after the pregnancy and we saw that these visual factors recovered over time. And then we went on to look at which factors would impact on your visual prognosis during pregnancy. And the most important factors that impact on visual prognosis were the duration of the disease that you had prior to pregnancy. So those that had had the disease for the longest had the best visual outcomes. Those that had the greatest reduction in papilledema before becoming pregnant had the best visual outcomes. And those that had the best control of their BMI prior to getting pregnant had the best visual outcomes. But the headache data was really very variable. And in all of the four cohorts, when we looked at what impacted on headache and then how headache behaved during and after pregnancy, the data was incredibly variable with no real patterns and just a very high headache load, irrespective of pregnancy or not. And what surprised you about the findings? Firstly, it was, it was very reassuring and really nice to see that pregnancy does not have an adverse effect on visual outcomes in IIH if you already have a diagnosis of IIH when you become pregnant. So I think we were predicting that we might see that there would be worse visual outcomes, but we didn't. And I think that's very reassuring for patients and for doctors. And that is despite the fact that we don't treat our patients with acetazolamide when they're pregnant in the UK. And, and we can perhaps explore that a little bit more. But um, I think that was the, the reassuringness of the data, I think, for the majority of patients is probably the main surprise. And how are patients with IAH treated during pregnancy? There aren't specific guidelines or lots of clinical practice data to really guide what we do during pregnancy. So based on the data that we have available, what our practice is, is that we would optimize the IIH prior to pregnancy if possible, and we would aim for disease control or disease remission with the papilledema coming down to either completely settling or remaining at very low level. When patients become pregnant, we do stop acetazolamide during particularly the first trimester when there's such a high risk of potential teratogenicity. And we do that because there are two data papers showing the teratogenicity of acetazolamide in rodents. That's the papers by Holmes et al. in 1988 and Kojima in 1999. And also the worry that we have that acetazolamide is now showing that it is causing growth retardation and growth stunting in children who have IIH. And that's the paper that just came out last month by Sheldon et al. in Frontiers of Ophthalmology. So we're quite cautious about the use of acetazolamide during pregnancy. And in the majority of cases, if disease is controlled, we would stop it. Then we would talk about um, optimizing weight and BMI. And maybe we'll come back and talk about that a bit more. And then finally, we increase the monitoring during pregnancy so that we're seeing patients more often to monitor for any flare up or recurrence of papilledema. And then we often will liaise with the obstetricians to talk about mode of delivery. And generally, our advice is that IIH patients don't need to change the mode of delivery because of a diagnosis of IIH. There is no evidence that you need to avoid going through a, a vaginal delivery and valsalva maneuvers during the second stage of labor. So unless this is a very extreme fulminant case, we would tell patients that they can choose the mode of delivery that they want and don't have to have this determined by a diagnosis of IIH. How often is optic fenestration considered in patients with optic nerve compromise during pregnancy, off medications, of course. In this cohort, none of the patients needed to go on to have surgical interventions who had but actually during the pregnancy, and that was optic nerve sheath fenestrations or shunting or venous stenting. So we haven't got experience of that. And certainly in the UK, optic nerve sheath fenestration is probably performed much less than it is, for example, in America. In Europe, there's sort of mixed practice depending on which centre you're in. But I think for the majority of the patients, we've been able to control the disease during pregnancy and not needed to go forward to have surgical interventions, which I think is what we would suggest. So you mentioned increased monitoring, uh, close follow-up, optimizing pre-existing IIH. Anything else that can improve clinical practice? Yeah, I think discussing weight is really important in pregnancy. So we know that people who have increased weight beyond a BMI of 30 have increased poor pregnancy outcomes. So we also know that weight gain during pregnancy, if it's higher than it should be, could potentially exacerbate IIH. So we're quite careful to talk about weight during pregnancy. Now, we don't have guidelines in IIH specifically, but there are certainly very robust guidelines that have come out from the US Institute of Medicine from 2009, which are very much used internationally, and they guide 
what to do with the patients that have a higher BMI in terms of how much weight they should gain during a pregnancy. And so, for example, you could keep some figures in your head that would say, for example, if somebody has a BMI between 30 and 35, they would aim to gain between two to six kilograms during pregnancy. If they have a BMI between 35 and 40, they would aim to gain less than five kilograms. And a BMI of greater than 40, they would aim to gain less than four kilograms. And that comes from the Life Cycle Project Maternal Obesity Childhood Outcomes Study from JAMA in 2019. And I think that's quite helpful because I think often there is worry that if weight is, is of too much weight gain or of too little weight gain, there will be poor outcomes. And I think these are the factors that need to be discussed with the obstetrician to target how much weight an individual should gain during each trimester to make sure they gain adequately, but not excessively during the pregnancy. And so how generalizable are your findings? Our cohort was the largest study that's been done so far in looking at pregnancy outcomes in IIH. And we have a cohort that represents patients that came in at all stages of disease with different severities of diseases that came into a tertiary referral hospital. So I think it is helpful, but I don't think we can extrapolate this necessarily to what goes on in, in different settings or different countries who may treat their IH patients in a different way. But we tend to treat our patients very much in line with the IH consensus guidelines, which came out in the JNNP in 2018. And so I think other centres that sort of follow that mode of practice would find these findings fairly generalizable. Wonderful. So what are the next steps for a study like this looking at maternal health and IIH? We had a look at a lot of NHS data over the last year. One of the observations that we've made in our IIH patients in terms of reproductive health is that they have a very high cesarean section rate. And as, as I sort of explained earlier, we often see this high C-section rate, although we often would tell obstetricians that if disease is stable, they don't need to go for a cesarean section, that they can have a normal vaginal delivery if that's otherwise OK for the patient. But I think one of the pieces of the puzzle is really to understand what happens to brain physiology during delivery and um, particularly during that second stage of labour. And perhaps an analogy to that is understanding what happens to brain physiology during, for example, repeated Valsalva manoeuvres. So something that we're interested in doing now is to study cerebrovascular dynamics and intracranial pressure during Valsalva maneuvers so that we can try and extrapolate to understand the stress that the brain and the optic nerve will go under during delivery. Thanks for the hard work that took years to accomplish. I really appreciate you being here on the Neurology Podcast. No problem. Thanks very much for talking to me. And this is Tisha Monti. Thank you for listening to the Neurology Podcast. Please check out the paper in February's edition of Neurology. This is Stacey Clardy, your podcast editor. If you've enjoyed the podcast, please take a few moments to subscribe, rate, and review the Neurology Podcast through Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen. And remember, you can always head to neurology.org backslash podcast for our full list of past episodes, or you can also search by keyword in your podcast app for any neurology-specific topics you want to learn about.